to tell me what the Ten Commandments are in order. Let's try that. Ariela. Watch your breath. Um, number one is, uh, thou shalt not have any gods before me. Mm-hmm. Number two is, thou shalt not have any graven images. Good. Number three is, um, thou shalt not, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Number four is, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, what you are doing now. Five. Number five is honor your father and mother, which is dad and you. Mm-hmm. And then after that, number six is um, do not kill. Mm-hmm. And number seven is do not commit adultery. Number eight is do not steal. Number nine is don't like bear false witnesses against your neighbor. False witness. Fourth, what? False witness. Oh, false, false witness. witness. Hard witness. to pronounce. Says, don't. Do not cover. That's the tenth one. Number ten is don't cover, but number nine, what is for bearing false witnesses? When you are doing what? You are accusing. You're accusing them of something that they didn't do. Precise, okay. which is one day. Very good. And why do we do that? Um, because all of the other days is when we do our pleasure. This 24 hours that we're doing now is for his pleasure. Everything is for him. Good, but why do we do that? Why do we even do that? Because he commanded it us to do Where? It. It's right there in the Ten Commandments. You see Jesus before? Yeah, in your bedroom. My bedroom? He was standing. And how did he look? He looked like a king. Really? What, what did he wear? He wore uh, like a white dress. Really? Is he beautiful? Yeah. Do you love him? Yeah. How much? Um. Really much. Really much? How about you? Do you love Jesus? Even? I love him with all my heart. He's everything to me. He's everything to me too. Very good, children. So we're going to have a nice Shabbat. Now you're going to go and study your Bibles, okay? Ooh. Okay. Yes, Say ma'am. Shabbat Mr. Shalom. President, ma'am. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. Shalom, people. <laughs> and who is, this, who is this young guy on the other side of the table? Daddy. <laughs> He's not young. Daddy, Grandpa. This yeah. is Grandpa. Grandpa. He's from Hungary. He's not, always hungry, too. I'm not no, hungry. no, you're, yeah, you're from Hungary, aren't yeah. you? I know. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> God bless you, and God bless uh, all that are able to be tuned in this morning uh, for our Shabbat service. And uh, today we are speaking on a prophecy out of the book of Malachi. And um, it's kind of an unusual prophecy. It's not one that we normally would probably think of. But uh, especially in light of the things that are going on, I just felt it would be uh, a a good message to bring this morning. And... Um, also, let me remind you, too, that tonight, uh, especially those of you guys that are watching on live stream, uh, we will be having at 7 p.m. a communion service. Uh, now, eventually, next month, more than likely, uh, we will also include foot washing. And I know that's kind of unusual. Not many people understand this part of a service, but it is biblical. And um, it is something when Yeshua, when they had communion service, he took and girded a towel around himself and he began to wash the feet of his disciples. In fact, when he comes to Peter, Peter said, Lord, not so. You know, he felt uh, embarrassed that he, because him knowing and have a revelation of who Yeshua was, he was God, manifested in a human body. And, And he said, Lord, don't wash my feet. And Yeshua made a very interesting comment. He says, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. Now think about that. No part with me. And then, of course, then Peter's response is zealous. You know, he says, Lord, not only my feet, but my head and my hands, everything. You know, and the Lord says, only your feet need to be washed. And so he left this as an ordinance or a command for us to do to one another as well, just as it was with communion. You know, it's the same time, same service. So 
So next uh, time we do the communion service, um, we will also uh, view for you so you can see how foot washing is done. Now, as a general rule, in the future I won't air that part. That is more of an intimate part of a service there that you do. But we see, we see this so many times in Scripture, not just then, but remember the woman that comes to Yeshua. And she, you know, Simon invites him over for this party, uh, and he comes. He doesn't deny he comes, you know, as a sinner to begin with, a chief of the sinners, no less, and yet he comes. And this lady, an ill-famed woman of their time, sees him in there with unwashed feet and unwelcomed at this party, and she busts through the party, comes over there, throws herself at his feet, and with her tears she washes his feet and dries his feet with the hair of her head. And, um, and yet, of course, these being Pharisees, very religious, the, the Jews of today in Israel, by the way, the Orthodox Jews there, and I don't say this for you to look down upon them because they are going to be the ones that are going to recognize Yeshua to be Mashiach. But it was our forefathers. You have to remember, I'm from the same tribe as they are. We are from the Levitical tribe. I'm from the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Levi. And it was our forefathers that were there that looked down upon him and said, if he knew what type of woman this was, he wouldn't let, him, let her touch him. Isn't that kind of strange you know think about that he said if he knew what this woman was he would not let her touch him because see the priest was not to be associating and so they knew him to be a rabbi and he's like you know well he didn't know but they just failed to recognize the word so as i say though it, it in fact it was very customary in that day because uh, when people would come in, the, the, after the travels, their feet were dirty, and there was always normally someone there to greet them and to wash their feet. In fact, they would kiss them, they would anoint them with oil, etc. So, all right, let's go right into the Word. That'll be again like tonight at 7 p.m., uh, and then on, um, uh, we will um, uh, also, by the way, before, let me, before I forget this, if you watch a little bit later today on YouTube, we will actually uh, post for you a video on, if you prefer. Now, you can go to a store and, and get uh, the, uh, the kosher bread. You can do that. Now, we don't shop ourselves on, on Shabbat, but what we do is make our own bread. And uh, so we will show you how that's done. We will actually post a video for you on how to make Passover bread. It's very simple. And so that that way, if you want to do that yourself, you're able to do so. All right, let's pray together before we go into the Word of God. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, in humbleness and humility, Lord, before you, <clears throat> knowing, dear God, that we as mortals, dear God, we're no one ourselves, but you through the shed blood of Yeshua, your Son, has made a way for us to be able to approach your throne. And we thank you for this, Lord, so wonderfully so, Lord. And we ask that you would bless the reading of your word and that you would bless, Lord God, us um, in partaking of your precious word. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach. And Yeshua L'Echad Anai. Amen. Uh, at the end of the service, we will do the the Torah reading as well, uh, and so I will ask my wife if she will slip me the Torah over here because I forgot to bring it out so we can read the Torah a little bit later uh, in the service. But anyway, I'd like to take you now to Malachi chapter 1 and starting with verse 1 through verse 5, those that have your Bible and would like to follow along. Uh, I, I did choose this time to use a King James Bible because many times when I read uh, on the YouTube videos, and I'm using a Jewish Bible and the English translation that we use, sometimes it stumbles the people because the words that we use, the way we translate is a little different than the, what uh, many of the Christian people do, so it, it kind of throws people off. Um, so it says here, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord. 
Yet you say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. Think of that. And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Hmm. He hated Esau. There's another scripture that, uh, and just paraphrasing it by memory, where he says in there, he says, I, I have loved Esau, excuse me, I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. And I believe this is in the Christian Bible before they were even born. Imagine that. How could God hate someone and yet they're not even born? They've done nothing as of yet. But the thing is with God is He is, His knowledge and His, his knowing before and in the past, the future, He knows everything and He knows what Esau would do. He knew what Esau would stand for. And I think maybe that might help you to understand better. It's not Esau himself, but it's the fact that Esau would represent a future nation of people, and that's what God hated. He hated. Esau had every bit of a right to try to serve God. He was he was a son of Abraham. Just as God said about Cain. I mean, a lot of people try to make Cain look like the worst guy on the planet Earth. Well, he was the worst guy there was at that time. But God comes to Cain and says, If you do well like your brother, will you not be accepted? Mercy was extended to him. But he still rejected it. And the thing is, is God knew before Esau was ever born. Not that his will was that the boy would be lost, but he also knew that he would not love God. He would not hold the birthright in high esteem and high regards. In many cases today, people can examine their lives and can see the same thing. They don't hold the birthright of, of Yeshua in high esteem. It doesn't matter to them. Well, you know, uh, you know, I'm a Christian, praise the Lord. And, uh, well, I, you know, I try to go to church, but, you know, I don't always get there. You know, and let me tell you something. I have, even if a person doesn't understand Sabbath, as we've been speaking on lately and everything, I have a respect for those people that have enough love of God to go to church and, and to at least devote their life to Him, and they take at least even if they do got it messed up and they do it on Sunday and they got, at least they love God enough, they're trying to show God their love by, by their sacrifice of their lives to Him. It's like when I get a lot of the emails. This is probably one of the reasons why I've never really talked about Sabbath that much is because I know when the Sabbath is. I know how to keep the Sabbath by God's grace, but I've gotten so many emails in from people saying, Brother Steve, how do we keep the Sabbath? We want to keep the Sabbath. We go to church on Sunday, but our church doesn't do that. And, 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 and then they'll talk about how that um, um, they can't find a church that does. In some cases, you'll find places that do keep Sabbath, a Messianic congregation, but, but they don't really get the Word of God like they need. So just because a place keeps the Sabbath, you know, it's like the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists, yes, they're, that, that's a part of the Word of God that they at least they got that right. Doesn't make the rest of the doctrine right, but they got that part right. They also recognize who the Antichrist is. They get this part right. But they don't necessarily get every part right. And, and I can't say that we got everything right either, but the thing is, is thank God at least they're doing something right. See, God will honor that. If you will honor His Word, He will honor you. And so this is why we... Uh, set together this particular service called the Shabbat service to do it at 11 a.m. on Saturday morning. And we chose the time mainly because we figured that the people on the West Coast of the United States, it wouldn't cause them to get up at 5 a.m. And at the same token, we could take all the way over into the, to Europe, into, uh, into Israel, it's seven hours normally different in time, five, six, seven hours roughly in that area there. 
So it puts it still on Shabbat for them. It's still a live Shabbat service. Now, unfortunately, you get on the opposite side of the world. I can't make it work for them. So that's why we load it on YouTube as well. But the, the whole purpose for this service here was to bring you guys into our service that we have, how we honor God in the Sabbath. And of course, from the time the sun sets, we have the Passover meal. Now, in Judaism, Passover is considered a festivity of, besides going to, the, to, to synagogue, uh, it's a time of eating. It's a big time of eating. Now, I'm not for that. I don't, that's why I don't go by all of the, the uh, oral laws that they have given to this. Because how, if, if all I do is stuff myself all day Saturday and just go, to, uh, my heart cannot be into his word because my body is dealing with food constantly. So I have issues with that. So I, I can't say that I go along with all the different teachings like that. Um, but I do, we do do the Passover meal. Uh, and we're going to share that with you before too long here. We're going to share with you what a Passover meal is like. Now, you'll, we'll be minus some of the traditions because in most Jewish homes, there's a lot of oral tradition mixed into that. So there's a lot of getting up, sitting down, uh, reading prayers. Uh, and these are not prayers that are biblical necessarily. These are oral traditions. So we don't get into every aspect of that. But there are some aspects that we do keep because we feel like it is honorable before God. Okay, so let, let's go back to the reading of this. And I'm going to have to just start over because I got sidetracked now. I apologize for that. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet, we, uh, you, yet you say, wherein um, have you loved us? Uh, was not Esau Jacob's brother, uh, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob? And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I've told you guys before, Rome is Edom today. And, I'm, and I've been asked, I know you guys have asked me many times, especially on YouTube, you've asked me. Brother Steve, we'd really like to know more. How do you come about this part? In fact, my good friend Lori Cadoza Moore was wanting to know more about this as well. And, uh, uh, and, and right before I go back home to Israel, another thought just throw it out there to you. Lori will be here with us and uh, we'll do an interview together. So hopefully before she even comes, I am going to take and do an in-depth study on Edom and how it is traced from Esau all the way to Rome. Okay. Whereas Adam saith, we are impoverished, uh, but we will return. Interesting, isn't it? Adam is going to return. We will return and build desolate places. He is talking about the temple on the temple mount. Because even Yeshua says, what does he say when he's weeping over Jerusalem? How often I would have hovered you as a hen with her own brood, but you would not. Your house is left unto you desolate. Until you say, blessed is he who comes, Besham, in the name of the Lord. I stop, I pause. It's not that I don't know it, but you have to keep in mind, I cannot say his divine name. Not yet. So they're going to build the desolate places. Now, by the way, when Yeshua says what he says, that is a compound meaning in that. Not only would the temple be destroyed, and because remember, what did Yeshua say? Tear this temple down, and in three days I'll build it back up again. And they thought he meant the actual temple. And they said, our fathers were 45 years building this temple, and, and, and if we tear it down, you're going to build it up in three days? But he was actually talking about his body. And so when Yeshua also says, your house is left unto you desolate, he's talking about the temple, but he's also talking about their heart. Because this is where God had intended for the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah glory, was to dwell not in the temple made with hands, but in the human heart. It's interesting, Rabbi Orly, 
a famous rabbi in Israel, he spoke about how that the temple itself and the way the temple is laid out is like the human body. And he said the Holy of Holies is located right where the human heart is located as well. Now, I thought that was rather fascinating because let me explain to you why. That also tells us, and he even recognized, let me just say this about Rabbi Orly as well, he even recognized that the Shekinah glory, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, dwelt in the Holy of Holies. He said, therefore, we should prepare our own bodies, our heart, to receive the Spirit of Almighty God to dwell in our hearts. Now that's something coming from an Orthodox rabbi. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Now, also, another, some things for you to think about. Yes, it's true. No wonder why Yeshua says his commandments would be written on the tables of your heart. As I said to you recently about him taking his finger and drawing in the sand. See, sand is, what is a stone made up of? Back when he was with Moses, and, and don't think it wasn't him with Moses because he even said, when, when they were condemning him to claim, they said, you say you're a man, you're a man under 50 years old, and you say you've seen Abraham, and he said, before Abraham was, I am. He didn't say, I am he. In the King James, they put the word he. Take the he out. It's in, a, it's in italics, right? He didn't say, I am he. He said, I am. Yahya. Not I was, not I will be, I am. I was there. I was the one with him. So if he was the one at the burning bush, notice the angel of the Lord was at the burning bush, right? The angel, the real reason it says angel, it doesn't make Jesus an quote-unquote angel like people try to put him, like the Jehovah's Witness, I think in the Seventh-day Adventists also try to make him an angel. It's not like that. This case here, you have to remember, Elohim. Elohim is, is a plural form for the word God. It doesn't mean that we have three gods, because literally it is translated out as the self-existing one. And that's exactly correct. But why is it Elohim? This is a good correct. Well, it's not even a correction for the Jews. The Jews already know. They know that there is an attribute of God. There is more. In other words, God can make himself known in more than one way. When it says that the angel of the Lord was in that bush, that was, and we know it was a fire, the part, the word angel there, you have to understand, is messenger in Hebrew. It doesn't mean someone flying around with wings, necessarily. But it was the form in which God was making himself known to Moses. That's why God uses the word angel. It was the form God chose to speak to Moses. The same we see when he comes to Abraham. Three come down there. The Bible says three angels come down. In other words, three messengers it actually translates, I think, in the, in, the, in, the Hebrew, in the English language, three strangers. They come down, but it also it says Melachim. But one of those angels was God himself, because Moses, when he writes it, he put yod He vav He. That is the spelling for God's divine name. And that was the one that stayed with Abraham when the other two go down to Lot to bring judgment. Why does it call them angels? Because why? Again, God, as he speaks to uh, uh, Moses and asks, excuse me, not Moses, but Abraham, as he speaks to Abraham and asks him, uh, getting it mixed up because I'm thinking of the burning bush there, so forgive me. But in the case of Abraham, he asks him, why did Sarah laugh in the tent behind you? Well, one he knew Sarah's name. These were strangers. It wasn't like Abraham said, you know, I'm Abraham, this is my wife. They already knew who he was. And he knows she laughs. And don't look down on Sarah neither because Abraham laughed too. In fact, God holds it to Abraham's charge because when they named the child Yitzhak, he says, he laughs is going to be his name. God put the, the charge on Abraham just like he did with Adam. So, interesting though, 
But Moses wrote in there that that angel was yod Hey vav Hey. It was Hashem. It was the Lord. It was God Himself standing there. But He calls Him an angel. Why? Because He's in a human body. It's the form in which God has taken upon Himself to reveal Himself to Abraham. So, all right. So I hope you can you, we follow that. All right. Now, got a little off track here. So let's go back. Verse 3, I hated Esau, laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness, whereas Adam saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord, Adonai, of hosts, of armies, they shall build, but I will throw down. What are they going to build? They're going to build the third temple. If, there, if it's speaking of desolate places, the one thing that is supposed to be desolate is the temple. Like I said, it's a compound meaning. Israel is desolate, showing that they... Be, I'm not talking about all Jews now, because you have to remember, if you believe Yeshua to be Mashiach, you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. And then your house is not left desolate. But Israel as a whole, as a nation of people, we are desolate. Our house is left desolate until when? We say, Baruch Haba, blessed Baruch. See? Haba, hu bo, ladonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When we recognize that Yeshua came in the name of Hashem, Then our house will be filled. Then, not only that, the temple is built, then uh, we receive the Holy Ghost. But we find out, according to Malachi's prophecy, it's going to be Adam that is going to what? According, we will return and build the desolate places. The Vatican is going to build the third temple. And I always wondered, because see, it was kind of odd. My wife asked the the spokesman there at the Temple Institute, the temple you guys are planning on building, is it going to be Ezekiel's temple? And he flat out, I'm standing there right beside him, he flat out says, no. The Temple Mount is not large enough for Ezekiel's temple to be built on it. Then she says, because she asked the question, when will this temple then be built? be torn down. He said, it's not going to be torn down. And so the, she goes, then what about Ezekiel's temple? If you say it's not going to be Ezekiel's temple, then when is Ezekiel's temple going to be built? And he didn't know how to answer her. Well, it's written right here in the Tanakh. It's written in the Bible. It's written in Malachi that Adam is going to build it and God is going to tear it down. No wonder why we have to have Ezekiel's temple. Because God is going to wipe it off. Let's look a little deeper with this here. I used to never know that. I, I used to think they would build it and it would be here. But then, you know, the whole problem was, is what do we do with Ezekiel's temple then? If, if the temple mount is not big enough, how are we going to build Ezekiel's temple then? All right. We will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build. You notice that? God says they're going to do it. But I will throw down. And they shall call them. Who's them? Who's them? Israel. This is, he's giving you hints to know who does this. So you'll know who Adam really is. They will call them, talking about the Jews, the children of Israel, the ones that are in their homeland right now. They will call them the border of wickedness. And the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Replacement theologist. Who is the chief of all of this? Is it not wrong? This is why they hate Israel. This is why the Pope 
doesn't ever acknowledge the state of Israel, but he acknowledges the state of Palestine. You don't think we don't already have two states? You're sadly mistaken. I had somebody write me and said, this nine-month negotiations, it didn't, it didn't bring out two states. Steve, you're a false prophet. For one, I'm not a prophet at all. But secondly, if you don't know that there's two states, something's wrong. It was during the nine-month negotiations, and by the way, that was only the smokescreen why the Vatican was making the covenant with Israel to begin with, because the covenant between uh, and Daniel has not... Is, the only reason the Palestinians are involved is because they are the small people in which Rome comes up with. Comes, you know, the prince that shall come comes up strong with the small people. That's the Palestinians. He uses them to be able to get leverage in the land. But if they didn't have two states, then you tell me how in the world the Vatican managed to be able to throw the Jews out of the tomb of David and hold a mass. I'm not talking about the upper room, the little room on top of the tomb of David. I'm talking about the tomb itself. They threw them out. By force. By force. And now the Jews that go on the Temple Mount, the Israeli authorities do nothing to stop the mobs from heckling the Jews that come up there. If Israel is in control of Jerusalem, why is this happening? If Israel is in control of Jerusalem, why is the Sabbath profaned? Week after week after week after week, and the Palestinians and the Christians, and excuse me, not Christians, true Christians would never do this. The, the Palestinians and the Catholic people can bring in their burdens on the Sabbath through the very gates of Jerusalem. And God said, do not allow it. Okay, forgive me. The border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Now they're putting this at the Lord's charge. God hates them. They're wiped off. They're finished. They don't believe Romans 11 at all. No, they don't believe Romans. And your eyes shall see and you shall say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. You see why? God is allowing this until he brings destruction upon them. Let me take and have you turn with me. And we'll close very soon. A couple of things I'd like to read to you. In Nahum, the prophet Nahum, if you would turn with me to uh, chapter 1. Verse 9, what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There is one come out of thee that, magnif excuse me, that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. They say Pope Francis is the peacemaker. Okay, Isaiah 9, 6. And to us a child is born. I'm paraphrasing. I don't want to paraphrase this. This is important for you to see this. Isaiah chapter 9. It's the famous scripture for the Messiah. In fact, the Jewish people, they don't even translate it in their own Bibles because they don't want it to apply to Yeshua. But he says, For unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Daniel 9 says that there would be an anointed prince that shall come, but he would be cut off at that 69th week. He doesn't say he's going to be cut off in the middle of the 70th week. He said he's going to be cut off at the end of the 69th week. Yeshua from 
uh, Nehemiah's uh, prophecy when Artaxerxes gave the decree to go forth and rebuild the, the, the streets and the walls and the moat until the time that Yeshua rides in as a victorious king on Palm, as they call it, Palm Sunday. I don't know how the dates are on this. I know that there's a lot of mess up in there. But anyway, when he rides in as a victorious king, it is exactly the 69 weeks, or if you break it down in years. I don't have time to break that down right now because I'd have to go back and relook at all that. But anyway, the 70th week has never been fulfilled. But then the scripture says in, 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 uh, in the book of um, Daniel chapter 9, that, a, that the prince that shall come would be of the people that destroy the temple. Or the sanctuary, I think. So I'm there again, just paraphrasing it. Now that prince that shall come is not anointed. He's not Moshiach. The word Moshiach is not in there for him. He is a false prince. But Daniel recognizes him to be a prince. So when you see in the word of God here, where it says, There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Why does he call him a counselor? Because Nahum is going back to what Isaiah 9, speaking of the true prince that shall come, the prince of peace, and he's also called a counselor. The Antichrist, Antichristo, who is a substitute for Mashiach. In other words, he is like him. He's supposed to be mimicking him, but he's not him. So therefore, everything that applied to Yeshua, he tries to copycat including the part about counselor. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down. Though they be quiet. Isn't that interesting? Though they be quiet. I've always heard about the Catholic Church. You go in there for one of their church, uh, they call it a mass and everything. And, and I actually have gone to see for myself. You're right, it's the quietest guy. You want somebody, by the way, if you don't want, me to, you don't want somebody that shouts when they speak and everything, go to the Catholic Church. They don't shout. The priest is just like, now everybody, I'm glad you come today. Let us see what is written in the catechism. That's where you can have your quiet service. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down. Many, why, they're all over the world. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now will I break his yoke. Now he's talking about Israel when he says, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. Now he's talking about Israel. But then he talks about them again. For now will I break his yoke from off thee. Who did the Jews want them to deliver when Yeshua come and they believed him to be the king of Israel? They believed him to be Mashiach. They know that when Mashiach comes, as Rabbi Tobias Singer, he will tell you this. When Mashiach comes, he is supposed to deliver the children of Israel from their enemies. And Israel's greatest enemy has been Rome. It was Rome back then. Rabbi Singer thinks, well, Yeshua couldn't have been him because he, he died and, 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 and he never did deliver them. But Rabbi Singer, like many other rabbis, never read, they seem to totally forget Daniel's prophecy. He's supposed to be cut off, not for himself, for us. But he did say he would come back. That's why he comes back. This is why Rome has gained the strong foothold in Israel once again. For now will I break his yoke off thee, and I will burst thy bonds in sunder. So God delivers us. Now as we close here, I just want to read to you, this is only a reminder, so that you will know what God intends to do. And I scattered them among the heathen. This is in Ezekiel 36. And they were dispersed through the countries, verse 19, according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. 
when they said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone, gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen whether you went. I will sanctify my great name which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also which uh, I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Do you know when you guys say the Lord's Prayer? When you say the Lord's Prayer, when Yeshua says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And notice he says at the beginning of the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. After reading Ezekiel 36, now you know why you've been praying this. It was to return Israel to her homeland. The only way to hallow God's name or to sanctify His name is what it means is when Israel come back to her homeland. She's in her homeland now. God's word, your prayer that they would be returned. This is why Yeshua had you pray this all through the years because God knew He had to have these prayers going up so that we would be delivered we would be delivered. In the Torah reading, I want to take you to Exodus, and the reason I'm taking you here is because this is the deliverance that is about to come. And I want to take you then to Exodus, Shemot, chapter 15. Just a couple of verses here. Chapter 15 is where we're going. Tetvav, for my Hebraic brethren, Shemot, um, chapter Shemot, Aleph and Bet. Az Yashir Moshe, Uven Er Yisrael et Hashira Hazot Ladonai. Ve Yamu Lemor Ashira Ladonai Kiga Aga O, Susper Kevo Rama Beyom. Azi Azmarat Ya, Ve Yahili Lashua. Ze Eli. The Anavahu Elohai Avi the Avramavneth Nehu. In the English language, it says that Moses and the children of Israel chose to sing this song to the Lord, and they said the following I shall sing to the Lord, for he has exalted above the arrogant, having hurled the horse with its rider, with his rider, it actually says, unto the sea. The might and vengeance of God was salvation for me. This is my God. God bless you. Shalom, shalom.